Hi, I'm Vincent Odekirken and uh, this is uh, the third of three videos in the series on Parkinson's disease. We previously discussed the uh, symptoms and the pathophysiology and uh, now we're going to be talking about the medical management of PD. So, there's a couple of things that we need to talk about when treating Parkinson's disease. So far, all the treatment options we have are symptomatic because there is no way to stop or uh, slow the disease progression with medication or other type of treatment. All options that have been tried have failed in this. So everything we do is merely symptomatic relief of severity of symptoms. Okay. Parkinson's disease is a disease that hits the brain and the body in many different parts and gives many different symptoms but most of the symptoms we have are catered towards the motor symptoms of PD so I'll be discussing that first. Step one is adding the substance that's missing levodopa since most of the motor symptoms are secondary to a lack of production of dopamine in the substantia nigra adding a synthetic variant of uh, dopamine, precursor levodopa, which you can admit, uh, for example, orally, is a good way of relieving the symptoms of PD, at least the motor symptoms. After the diagnosis of PD uh, is made, this is usually the first step of treatment. Apart from this, you should add counseling about the disease, what people can expect, what it means for their job or their personal life and how they can uh, make their functioning optimal uh, in consulting with uh, specialists in uh, physiotherapy or dynamics and so on and so on. So uh, the paramedical treatment is also very important in managing PD earlier and later in disease. It should be a multidisciplinary team if multidisciplinary symptoms are present and if the patient wants to have all these different types of treatment. It's uh, the patient who chooses what is fit for them after consulting with their doctor. But medically speaking, or uh, pharmacologically speaking, levodopa is usually the mainstay in early treatment of Parkinson's disease. How does that work? I usually use the dopamine reservoir funnel model to explain the dopamine uh, model to patients. You need to have dopamine available to your basal ganglia to make motor movements. So if you have lack of dopamine, there's too little movement. And if you have an excess of dopamine, you have an excess of movement. And usually the brain is pretty much able to buffer the amount of dopamine that is available to cater to the amount of movement that is adequate. But in Parkinson's, that funnel model that uh, buffers your dopamine uh, fails over time. So, substantia nigra, which we talked about before in a previous video, is the part of your brain that produces dopamine. And um, the substantia nigra and the nigrostriatal projections creates a buffer of dopamine that, that can be used for uh, starting motor movements starting movement patterns. You have a, you have a buffer, a funnel and a, a reservoir of dopamine available to cater to uh, the requested movements. If that reservoir is full, that, that's, uh, you have enough dopamine and it depends on how much dopamine there is being made, how big the reservoir is and how quickly it is used through the funnel. So these three factors are in this model important in the availability of dopamine for your substantia nigra and the nigrostriatal projections. So in a normal situation in healthy people with no nigrostriatal deficiencies, there is enough dopamine production and the reservoir is full and there is enough being used by the basal ganglia. In Parkinson's disease, you need to add pulsatile doses of levodopa, the dopamine precursor, to that reservoir to keep it full enough alongside the dopamine production of the substantia nigra. It's not easy getting it to the brain. There are a lot of uh, 
ways that dopamine can be impaired from reaching this reservoir. You have loss gastrointestinally through to slowed gastric emptying, emptying or motility of the gastrointestinal system. You need to absorb dopamine over your uh, gastrointestinal lining and it can be broken down there. Um, you have to get it into your tissues and there is already breakdown of dopamine or at least levodopa uh, outside of the blood-brain barrier and then it has to get over the blood-brain barrier to be broken down from uh, levodopa to dopamine in the brain. So it, you have to take a lot of hurdles as a levodopa molecule to reach the brain and be broken down to dopamine where it is effective. So pulsatile oral ingestion of levodopa uh, has a lot of hurdles before reaching that reservoir of dopamine. If you imagine this being the gut, so the, the yellow lining being the intestine and the black line being the intestinal wall with uh, the blood and, and the tissues outside of your brain as depicted as red and the brain here as gray with the second dotted line being the blood brain barrier. If you administer levodopa orally through your mouth it enters your gut. Here it can already be broken down by for instance your uh, microbial tissues in your gut and it has to reach the place in the gut where it can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So your uh, small intestine, your jejunum to be precise. There it has to pass the gastrointestinal lining and go towards uh, your blood. And even further, it has can be broken down here to dopamine. And in, when dopamine is available here, it's not functional. It just creates side effects because dopamine in your blood doesn't increase your pool in your brain. You need it to be broken down from levodopa to dopamine in your brain. It can also be broken down to other products that are not useful for uh, the treatment of PD. So here there's a lot of, a lot of breakdown into different molecules that hampers the uh, the amount of dopamine that is actually available for your brain. Then it has to pass the blood-brain barrier, like this, to be levodopa within the brain and availability for the uh, substantia nigra. Here there's also a breakdown of levodopa, but that's a good thing because you want it to be broken down into dopamine. You also want it uh, to be available as dopamine for a long time, so it should be broken down into the further steps of the dopamine uh, cyclus. Uh, so the breakdown from dopamine into its breakdown products should be slowed if possible. Carbidopa is what's always added to levodopa in a single uh, tablet. Uh, blocks the dopamine breakdown from levodopa in your blood and tissues. So peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor is what it is. Then you have CMT inhibitors that cause uh, the, the cessation of breakdown into the other products that are uh, available in uh, the blood and in uh, brain tissue. Mayo B inhibitors inhibit the breakdown from dopamine into its breakdown products in your brain. And CMT, which we mentioned before, also inhibits the breakdown into other products from dopamine in your brain over here. So, what happens if there's too much levodopa? If there's too much levodopa added and there's too much dopamine in the brain available, the reservoir is not capable of handling all the dopamine and you have overflow causing excess of movement. We call it dyskinesia. If there's a total lack of levodopa and thus dopamine in your brain, and there's no dopamine available for the nigrostriatal projections, so uh, there's a lack of movement, bradykinesia, rigidity, tremor. So we call that the off state. As the disease progresses, you can imagine that the nigrostriatal uh, degeneration is uh, more and more, and that leads to uh, less tolerability in fluctuations because your reservoir gets smaller. So it's easier to get it empty, but it's also easier to get an excess 
because the reservoir is so small. What do you notice from that on the outside? You get motor fluctuation. Early in the disease, with a couple of pills a day of levodopa, you can keep them in the green zone where the funnel and the reservoir are not empty, but also not overflowing. We call that the on state. But as the disease progresses and the reservoir gets smaller and smaller, it's harder just with oral medication to keep them in that green zone because they start to fluctuate towards uh, off state where the reservoir is empty and dyskinetic states in which the reservoir overflows. And there are so many barriers before getting levodopa into the brain that you cannot exactly time your medication that well to keep it in a green zone. You call that motor fluctuation or medication induced motor fluctuation. So they have green zones, yellow zones and red zones. And this part of the disease you can try add-on medication to reduce the breakdown of dopamine in your brain or the breakdown of levodopa in your blood. There are a couple of different ways of trying to get dopamine to be available for that uh, funnel and reservoir without it overflowing. Um, so if you look at it from our previously defined clinical stages you have levodopa and another medication which is called the dopamine agonist for that first-line treatment in getting more dopamine to your nigrostriatal system and if response fluctuations tend to occur and dyskinesias and off state dystonias or on state dystonias you need to try to get it back to the green zone by adding medication to keep the dopamine in your brain leveled and those are the previously uh, previously the discussed cmt inhibitor Mayo B inhibitor and a separate type of medication called amantadine, which is mainly useful for treating dyskinesia. It's a dyskinesia inhibitor that also helps against motor symptoms a little bit. But the disease progresses, and even if you add these medications, it's often hard to keep patients in the green zone when you're talking about motor symptoms. So sometimes you have to go to advanced treatments like deep brain stimulation continuous intestinal uh, infusion of levodopa or apomorphine pumps uh, subcutaneously to keep the dopamine uh, production or the dopamine availability in the brain leveled. And as disease progresses more to the more cortical uh, non-motor symptoms, there aren't very good treatments for those symptoms yet because they're not levodopa responsive. So we have some medication that be can be given in uh, light uh, cognitive disorders, but uh, balance and posture and autonomic symptoms are very hard to treat and medication is usually not that responsive. So the things apart from levodopa, we mentioned the uh, direct postsynaptic dopamine receptor stimulation, the dopamine agonist, which works kind of the same as levodopa and only bypasses the whole levodopa into dopamine breakdown system. You have medication that indirectly affects the dopamine and dopamine breakdown. So from levodopa to dopamine and from dopamine to the breakdown products. We discussed that in the model that we saw from blood, uh, from gut to blood to brain. And you have the super indirect uh, treatment options that are not very dopamine uh, dependent. So direct postsynaptic dopamine receptor stimulation, that's uh, all the dopamine agonists, and there are a lot of different brands uh, that cater towards this. Uh, of those, probably Promipexil and Ropinerol uh, being the most used, at least here in the Netherlands, but all are uh, more or less equally effective. And the fact is that while levodopa and thus dopamine mainly um, stimulates the DT, D2 postsynaptic receptors. These agonists also have more of a D3 and a D4 affinity, which can cause um, potentially more side effects on um, impulse control disorders, uh, edema, uh, and uh, limbic symptoms. So that's something that you have to keep an eye out for hyper impulsivity, um, like uh, gambling, hypersexuality, and so on and so on. So when starting uh, patients on this, those are things that you have to keep an eye on after starting the medication. So things we warn for is uh, hypersomnolence, so 
after starting medication that they can have sleep attacks. So uh, not driving for a little while after starting this medication is usually good advice to see if they have um, sleep attacks or not. It's very rare, but if it happens, it can be dangerous. Next category, the indirect effect of levodopa towards dopamine and its breakdown. Carbidopa is something that you cannot go without. Um, the main options for the peripheral deep carboxylase inhibitors are, as I say, carbidopa, but there's another one, benzerazide. Uh, the brand names being Cinemet and Metapar that are used often. You have the CMT inhibitors, which we discussed in the model before, like Antecapone. And if you add it to Levodopa or Carbidopa, it's called the, the brand Stelevo. You have the Mayo B inhibitors like Rosagiline, Selegiline, and Safinamide. Um, and those are all, um, in a way, affecting uh, the green zone, red zone, yellow zone um, balance in trying to get it more towards the green zone. So uh, reducing breakdown of dopamine or levodopa and uh, getting it to the place where it works so uh, beyond the blood brain barrier there's also some medication that's not for the motor symptoms or it works super indirect without affecting your dopamine system amantadine i mentioned before um, which is uh, mostly anti-dyskinetic so against excessive movements rivastigmine uh, which is the brand name Exelon, and there's others too, which uh, is against slight cognitive disorders and can um, sometimes have a good effect on attention span or multitasking, but is uh, effective in about one or one on one in five patients. So it's it's no um, it's not not great in four and five patients. Uh, side effects it can have dry mouth and diarrhea, and then you have the anti tremor medication, which also works sometimes a little bit anti um, uh, hypokinetic. The bipyridine and the beta blockers were good against tremor dominant uh, phenotypes. For anxiety and mood disorders, you can use SSRIs or tricyclic uh, antidepressants like acetylopram, venlafaxine, and paroxetine. There's a whole list, and um, that's useful for treating some of the non motor symptoms. So, if you're talking about pills, Levodopa is still the go-to treatment in the management of PD, even though it's been around for about 50 years. The way we're getting levodopa to the blood-brain barrier is changing, and we're adding medication to the treatment to keep those levels of dopamine in the brain as stable as we can, but it's getting harder and harder as the disease progresses. And I think the funnel and reservoir concept is very useful when explaining motor fluctuation to patients, because if the patient can explain to you what's going on in their daily life, you can adjust the medication in a way that caters towards more on state without dyskinesia. So if the patient understands the dopamine concept, then it's, hard, uh, then it's less hard to treat them uh, adequately by adjusting the medication scheme. There are many non levodopa options that work well as add-on treatments in motor and non-motor symptoms. Okay, so that's the pills. If pills don't work as good as you want them and you still have uh, hindersome uh, response fluctuations of their motor symptoms, you can switch to advanced therapies. And these are all catered towards decreasing medication-induced motor fluctuation. So it's for people who have lots of bothersome symptoms that are caused by motor symptom fluctuation. So if pills don't work, one of the things you can do is uh, switch to subcutaneous uh, infusion of a pro-dopamine substance, which can be a dopamine agonist or uh, uh, a new um, studies going into subcutaneous levodopa. And, uh, it's called the Neuroderm uh, Boundless Study. It's uh, yet to be established in clinical trials for phase three, um, large scale medication trials, but we have to see if that works, but it's a good option probably. You have intrajejunal uh, levodopa administration through a PEG tube, and you have deep brain stimulation as your three main routes of advanced uh, reduction of motor fluctuation. So, option one, still levodopa, get it to the blood 
brain barrier. And because the system starts to fail in getting a stable response of getting it to the blood-brain barrier and the funnel and reservoir are getting smaller and smaller, one of the ways of reducing fluctuation is by giving continuous small dose levodopa ingestions through the peg tube, through an inhaler, or through subcutaneous uh, ingestion, uh, subcutaneous infusion. So this has been already clinically established, uh, gastrointestinal jejunal uh, infusion of levodopa is a good way of reducing motor response fluctuations. And these two are still under clinical investigations. Trials are currently pending. We know from the levodopa infusion through a PEG tube that it, uh, one of the brand names called Duodopa, that it reduces the off time per day with two hours, which is the same as deep brain stimulation, which I will discuss later. The on time without troublesome dyskinesia, so the time in the green zone, is improved by about two hours in uh, the continuous levodopa infusions and by about three hours in DBS. So that seems to be a little bit better with DBS, but these are all indirect comparisons. So there are no randomized controlled trials uh, as of yet between Duodopa and DBS. Uh, one is being uh, currently done here in the Netherlands, but uh, results are still pending. Both improve quality of life, different skills were used, but it seems to be in the same category of order of improvement. Um, how long does the effect last? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, deep brain stimulation has been around for uh, around about 30 years of clinical practice and lasts long in improving the motor symptoms, but as it doesn't stop the disease, other symptoms uh, still occur and motor symptoms still tend to worsen, but with less fluctuation over the time. So it does improve motor symptom uh, response in the long term, but quality of life slowly deteriorates as the disease progresses. Same goes for CLI, uh, only the amount of people that uh, stop their therapy after a while within the first uh, 10 years is about 40 percent and this is due to uh, uh, usually local discomfort with the peg tube or it being not efficacious enough for them or um, uh, well that's probably the two main types of reasons why people uh, stop the therapy. Five-year costs, as uh, estimated through several studies, are about 230,000 euros for duodopa therapy, or at least the CLI therapy, and about 88,000 for the deep brain stimulation if you look at all summative costs in the first uh, five years. So there tends to be a difference there too. We don't know what's technically better since they haven't been head-to-head -head compared, but these are some numbers as we can uh, obtain through the uh, randomized trials that have been uh, done in some other publications in the last uh, 20 years. So there's the INVEST trial that's uh, currently going on that compares deep brain stimulation to CLI, continuous infusion, and uh, we're anxiously awaiting those results because those might give us more insight into what should be the first choice uh, in uh, advanced therapies when people don't respond enough to medication anymore. Then there is the subcutaneous levodopa administration that I talked about before that's still in trial phase. And that works very well if you look at uh, pharmacokinetics. It improves the change in available plasma levodopa. This is baseline and this is after placebo. This is after the subcutaneous treatment with levodopa. So where there's a lot of plasma fluctuation in levodopa availability on baseline, and there's no improvement after placebo, you see a very stable line. This is a logarithmic uh, around the 1,000 uh, uh, nanograms per milliliter line. So this is a much more stable response than to oral therapy. So that's good news. Uh, uh, for sure, but if it works as well on clinical symptoms, that's currently being investigated. The inhaler, there are some more motor symptom data. So this is the levodopa inhaler CVT301 trial in which you see here the time after dose intake from the inhaler and here the change in UPDRS score, which is a motor score 
And if you see a negative score, that means improvement of motor symptoms. And compared to the placebo, both the 60 and the 84 milligram dose uh, lower the score by about uh, 8 to 10, while the placebo only lowers it by 6. And that's a clinical important difference. More than three points on the eupoderis is considered minimally uh, clinically important different. Um, and this is four points, so that seems to be a, a, a good symptomatic treatment. This is already FDA approved. It's not available in Europe as far as I know. That levodopa inhaler, if you look at the two uh, dosages compared to placebo, this is another way of putting it in patients that are in on state. So it improves the amount of patients in on state after a while after in after uh, inhaling the medication. So that's a that's a significant uh, improvement in add-on therapy to get rid of your off phases. That's all dopamine related. Option two uh, in the advanced therapies is not dopamine related, at least not directly, but it is bypassing the dopamine route by administering electrical discharges to the brain in the basal ganglia area and thus inhibiting the hypokinetic pathways, indirectly normalizing the amount of data that is sent from the basal ganglia to the body and thus uh, reducing the motor symptoms. So by inhibiting parts of the brain through high frequency stimulation, you reduce the motor symptoms. That's done by uh, implanting two electrodes into the basal ganglia. Here you see one on each brain side. This is a coronal slide of the brain. For instance, here you see the tip of the electrode where the electrical pulses are coming from in the substantia or in the subthalamic nucleus close to the substantia nigra. It's an important part of the uh, basal ganglia network. And within that here uh, pink uh, subthalamic nucleus, there are four tips on the electrode that can be liquidity uh, put as a uh, a cathode or anode and thus creating a electrical current and the current inhibits that nucleus and thus inhibiting the symptoms so minus minus is plus uh, it's a very short explanation there's a, a much more theory behind it but i'll keep it this short how do you do that it's done through stereotactic surgery this is the lexel frame it's a stereotactic frame which is uh, uh, screwed onto the skull with four points screwed onto the skull under local sedation with a, a, an anesthetic agent and there are numbers in an X Y and Z configuration creating an atlas three-dimensional of every point that's inside this frame and there's also an, an arc with a ring that can make you get from any point A to point B on a certain angle with a certain depth. So what you do is you create an atlas of the brain and a way to navigate from point A to point B with a millimeter accuracy. If you make an MRI with this frame on, you can uh, uh, use some uh, anatomical waypoints to uh, figure out where you want to go and where those basal ganglia are and uh, figure out a route how to get there without um, hitting critical areas of the brain. And if you do that, you can make a roadmap for your stereotactic surgery. And you want the electrode to end up in the subthalamic nucleus seen here. This is the thalamus, this is substantia nigra. And if you want to get it over here, you have to get the electrode on a certain angle with the electrode tip in and around the uh, substantia or, or the subthalamic nucleus. And this area is about 12 millimeters in total length. You have four options of stimulating along that curve. Usually that is done in awake surgery, at least partially, to see if there's also a direct motor response to the treatment. So you give a test uh, stimulation to see if motor symptoms are reduced if you uh, inhibit that part of the brain by uh, high frequency stimulation. Uh, nowadays, a lot of centers also operate Parkinson's disease under general anesthesia because uh, imaging techniques have improved, but both awake and full anesthetic surgery are currently being applied. 
This is a post-operative x-ray of the brain where you see two wires going into the brain and these look very asymmetrical but that's most of the positioning uh, of a artifact of the photograph so these are probably perfectly aligned to the bilateral subthalamic nuclei. You see four little tips of the electrode that can be uh, used for electrical pulses post-operatively. You see little electrical wires going here and going under the skin over the skull through the neck towards um, the chest where a pacemaker is being implanted that is connected to these wires and can uh, deliver the pulses to the brain. So those are the outlines for medical therapy in Parkinson's disease as we know. As we said, you treat the motor symptoms, there is no disease cure yet, there is no way of really uh, slowing the disease progression, so we treat symptoms. We have treated before that in the previous video the pathophysiology. And in this video we've said that if you treat the symptoms, step one is levodopa and Step two is adding other dopaminergic agents to uh, the levodopa regimen and trying to keep patients in that green zone. And if that doesn't work because motor fluctuation has become too prominent and the reservoir has become too small, you can uh, add on advanced treatments like deep brain stimulation, continuous levodopa infusion or subcutaneous levodopa infusion or dopamine agonist infusion or even inhalation of which some are still in experimental setting. This is the last of my free videos on Parkinson's disease for uh, this year. Uh, if you want to see more on neurology go to my YouTube channel and like and subscribe if you like the contact content. I uh, thank you for your time and have a good day.